morning. We're in Perak of Bays of Yeshaya in the Art Scroll print. We're on page 166. We read the last two psukim, the last three psukim last week, and we read some of the commentary, and we said we'll come back to these psukim. Let's take a look at the psukim again. Page 166, Perak Chav Beis, Pasuk Yud Beis, chapter 22, verse 12. Vayikra Hashem Elokim Tzavakot Bayom Ahu Levchi Ula Mispeid Ula Korcha Valacha Korasak And on that day of the destruction of Yerushalayim, the destruction of Beis HaMikdash, you recall that chapter 22 in Yeshaya is the Masa, it's his prophecy about the destruction of Yerushalayim in the Beis HaMikdash, and this is a hundred, this is probably 120 years um, before the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. And as we mentioned, the Rambam in Hilchis Yisodei HaTorah explains from the Gemara that a prophecy <coughs> by a Navi that is um, talks about ruination, talks about destruction, does not necessarily have to come true. People can do tshuva as the people in Ninveh did Shuva in the time of Yonah, after Yonah prophesied that they would be destroyed. It doesn't denigrate Yonah in one in one in one, any way, in one iota. He is a Navi. He didn't prophesy falsely. The people did Shuva. So here, Yeshaya is, on the other hand, when a Navi prophesizes for the good, those things will come true. So here, Yeshaya is prophesizing in chapter 22 about the destruction that will occur to Yushalayim in the Beis Hamikdash, which means if you don't do tshuva. If you do tshuva, obviously, you can avoid it. Unfortunately, the Jewish people did not avoid it. We talked about that last week. So on that day, the Rabbana Shalom will call for crying eulogies, ripping out one's hair. We talked about that idea and the dining of sackcloth. In other words, in heaven, this will be a day of mourning and lamenting, and it doesn't mean that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is crying. We went through that as well several weeks ago. The Gemara in Chagiga, and Afheyom at Beis, the Gemara talks about this idea of God crying. Of course, it's symbolic. Uh, we've talked about that as well through the Ramam and Hilchas Yisodei Torah. Uh, which we will get to. The the Dibra Torah Kalashim B'nai Adam, the Rabboni Shalom transmits to us ideas on a human level. We have we have a human brain, so no matter how great the brain is, they're still human, and we can only understand what a human can understand. And so the Rabboni Shalom talks to us in a way that humans can understand. So it says the Rabban Shalom calls to stay a day for crying. It doesn't mean God, the Rabban Shalom has eyes. It doesn't mean he sheds tears. It means that in Shamayim something is happening that is causing, now that we learned the Das Tavunos and the Ramchal, or part of the safe, we know the difference between a Hestip Panim and a Ha'oras Panim. So to a certain extent, when the Pasuk says that the Rabbana Shalom is going to, it calls for this day to be a day of crying, a day of weeping, a day of lamenting, when a person cries and he weeps and laments, what does that mean? It's a state of constriction. A person draws into himself. When a person is happy, he opens up and he's jovial and he's smiling, and he's talking to people, and he's engaging people. When a person is in a state of crying, in a straight state of lamenting, in a state of mourning, he draws into himself. So the And, and that's the idea of Hastaras Panim. So when it says God called for this day to be a day of crying, lamenting, what that means is in Shamayim, this is going to be a day of Hester Panim. In response to this Navur, remember this is a Navur. Yeshaya is not telling the story as it's happening. He's telling the story 120 years about before it's going to happen. And if you don't do tshuva, on that day, there will be the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of Yerushalayim, and God will call the day a day of mourning and lamenting and crying. And what will the Jews be doing? 
Again, Yeshai is saying that this is what's going to happen in 120 years. Vine sasain v'simcha harig bakar v'shachet sain achal basa v'shasas yain achal v'shasay ki machanomus. For me personally, this is one of the most frightening psukim <clears throat> in all of the Torah, Nevi'im, and Ksuvim. In terms of Jewish reaction to something, the Pasuk says, Yet behold, while God is calling for a day of crying, lamenting, and mourning, what's going on on planet Earth? The Jewish people are saying there is joy and gladness, slaying of cattle and slaughtering of sheep, eating meat, drinking wine, eat and drink, for tomorrow we will die. That's their response. What, 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 are we, what response are we talking about? This is 120 years approximately before it happens. Yeshai is telling the Jewish people, you should know that you're going to stray so far from God that when the Beis HaMikdash is destroyed <clears throat> and the Yushalayim is destroyed and God calls for a day of lamenting and crying, you're going to be calling for a day of a smorgasbord. God is calling out, cry, mourn, weep, do something. And the Jewish people will say, let's get some more cattle, let's make a barbecue, let's make a smorgasbord. <clears throat> now, as we mentioned last week, the Jews lived eventually through this prophecy. Yeshua, 120 years before the Horban, approximately, there are people that heard this Navua, and they certainly discussed it with their families. They discussed it with their children. They heard about it. 120 years later, there are many Jews that are familiar with Yeshaya's Navua. And Yeshaya told them that when the Babylonians, as an example, we learned last week, when the Babylonians start breaking down the wall of Yerushalayim. They make breaches in the wall so they can come in and conquer Jerusalem. You will take down some, you will take apart some of your houses inside Yerushalayim and use the stones to fill up the breaches in the wall as if that's going to save you from the Babylonians. And Yeshaya tells them 120 years in advance, it is not going to save you. They will breach the wall. The only thing that will save you is Chuva. So 120 years before this happens, Yeshaya says, listen, I'm telling you that eventually with your own hands, you're going to remove stones from your houses, put them in the walls of your shalim to save yourselves from Babylonians, and it's not going to help. And 120 years later, they're removing stones from their houses and putting it into the walls of your shalim to save themselves from the Babylonians. Exactly. They're doing with their hands exactly what Yeshaya said 120 years ago they would do. And no red light goes off in their, in their, in their brains. Hey, what it, ding dong, what exactly are we doing? Yeshaya said we're going to do this and we're doing it with our own hands. And it's not going to help. But they continue to do it. And they come to the point where, in fact, they say, let's have a party, because tomorrow we shall die. And now Yeshaya tells them in, in verse 14, And this will become revealed in the ears of Hashem. Uh, we're going to leave that aside for today. What does it mean? It will be revealed to Hashem. Hashem knows it. <laughs> he don't, no one has to reveal it to him. Im Hashem This sin will never be atoned for until you die, said Hashem. And this is where we left off last week. We say we're going to discuss this concept, which is Chil Hashem. We take a look on page 167. <clears throat> the bottom of the page, left-hand corner. This, that this sin will never be atoned for until you die. Because the people of Israel desecrated God's name, they will not receive atonement until they die at the hand of the enemy. One who is guilty of this grievous sin must repent, of course, but even with Yom Kippur and suffering, atonement is completed only with the sinner's death. And that's a quote from the Radak, who's quoting the Gemara in Yoma, Pei Vav We explained last week 
that there are different levels of Averis, and each level of Avera has its own uh, requirements in tshuva. If a person violates a positive commandment, in other words, he does something by not, he, he does an Avera by not doing something. He's supposed to eat matzah lel pesach, he intentionally doesn't eat matzah. So he didn't, affer- he didn't actively do something, he just didn't do something. One level of Avera. Then there's the Avera where you actively do something, you eat chazer. That's an Avera for which a person gets 39 lashes. Then there's an Avera where a person gets the heavenly death penalty. Then there's a, a, the Avera where a person gets executed. And there, these are all Averas that have different levels of tshuva. And part of the tshuva that a person has to go through is eating chazer intentionally with witnesses. A person would get 39 lashes. That is part of his atonement process. If he gets the 39 lashes and doesn't do tshuva, he still doesn't have a kapara. Before a person, Leilena, was executed for an Avera he did, there's a whole process the Gemara and Sanhedrin talks about where he said vidui in order to complete his tshuva before he's executed. This is all part of the kapara process. The, um, the so to speak, at the top of this uh, mountain, the top of this hierarchy is the sin of Chil Hashem, which is very interesting. Chil Hashem, somebody does a Chil Hashem chas v'shom. Um, if we want to get highly technical in the rules of Chil Hashem, we'll give an example, the highly technical halachic definition of Chil Hashem, the Gemara in Sanhedrin, as, as the Ramam explains it to us, a person does something, he uh, eats chazer, in front of 10 other Jews. 10 other Jews witness him eating chaza, enjoying the chaza, and now these 10 people walk away, and there's a chil Hashem. They say, you know, we witnessed today Reuven, he was eating chaza, he was having a good time, he was eating chaza. That's a chil Hashem, he needs 10 Jews. We're not going to get into all the technical halacha details of chil Hashem. But that's the basic idea of chil Hashem. So let's take this case. A person ate chaza in front of 10 people. A person ate chaza in front of two witnesses who gave him hasra, they warned him. He ate it anyway. He gets his 39 lashes. He says, Vidu Yanyim Kippur. He does tshuva and he has his kapara. He does a sincere tshuva. He's atoned for his sin. We take that same person and he eats chaza in front of 10 Jews, and this is now Chaza with a Chil Hashem. Chaza with a Chil Hashem, the person's going to get the 39 lashes, he's going to say his Vidu Yanyam Kippur, and he's still not going to get a Kapora until he dies. He cannot atone for the sin until he dies. Until he dies, he's in the category of a sinner for this purpose, because Chil Hashem is not atoned for until the person dies. How does the Gemara know this? The Gemara knows this from this Pasuk in Yishai. HaKadosh Baruch who said, this will be a day of lamenting. And the Jewish people said, this will be a day for a barbecue and a smorgasbord. And Yishai then tells them, this is going to be revealed to the ears of God, your reaction, your smorgasbord barbecue reaction. And the Rabbana Shalom says, this is the type of sin that will not be atoned for until you die. And that's how the Gemara and Yuma Pevav knows that this is an Aveira, Chil Hashem is an Aveira for which a person cannot get an atonement until he dies. So first, let's get an understanding of the concept of Chil Hashem, Chas V'Sholem. Chil Hashem obviously means a desecration of God's name. It's helpful uh, the Maral talks about this, it's always helpful to get, obtain a definition of a Hebrew word, a Hebrew phrase, a, he, a phrase, a Hebrew concept, to go back to the first place it's mentioned. If you go back to the first place it's mentioned, that's like the source of this word. What did this word mean in the, in the place it was first used? And that will give you an idea of what in Lushan Kodesh this word means. That word can be used in other contexts. But what does it mean? Lo, go back to the first place it's used. If we go back to Beratius, 
Parshas Bereshis, Perek Dalit, Pasuk Chavav, Pasuk Chafei, it says that Adam and his wife had a third son. Remember, Cain killed Hevel, so Hevel's not here. Cain's been banished. And Adam and his wife have a new son, and he's called Shes. And basically, everybody, the whole world comes from Shes because Hevel, Cain killed Hevel, so he's gone. And God punished Cain and basically wiped out his whole family. We are all descendants of Shes. Okay, that's Pasuk Chafei. Pasuk Chafov, Ula Shes, Gam Hu Yulad Ben. Shes is a son of Adam and Chava. Shes had a son and his name, Vayikra Shmo Enosh. And Shes called his son Enosh. Enosh, so you have Adam and Chava had Shes, and Shes had Enosh. Enosh is a grandson of Adam and Chava. Oz, and in the days of Enosh, Huchal, that word Chilul, Huchal Likro B'Shem Hashem. In that day, men began to call idols by the name of Hashem. In other words, in the days of Enosh, he's a grandson of Adam and Chava. We're very close in time to Adam and Chava. Adam and Chava had a son, Shez, and they told Shez, we want you to know God created us. Tata uh, Lashez, we don't have a father and a mother because we're the handiwork of God himself, and you are our son. So Shez knows that his parents are Maise Yod of Shalakodesh Baruch, with Yitzir Kapov, they're created, they're the handiwork, direct handiwork of God, he knows this. He has a son, Enosh, and already in that generation, people are beginning to call idols by the name of Hashem. In other words, they're taking Hashem's name and they're saying instead of Hashem is the creator or Hashem is the sovereign, they begin taking the name of Hashem and applying it to the sun, the moon, the trees, whatever they were applying it to. That is the first context in which we have Chilol Hashem, Oz Hucha Likro B'Shem Hashem. And then they took Hashem's name and they, Huchal in this context means they began, but Huchal also means, we'll read Rashi now, Az Huchal Lashon Chulin. This word is related to Chulin. When we talk about Chulin, we have a concept in Halacha called Kadosh. Something is holy. A korban is Kadosh. And then we have Chulin. The Monday, you go to the butcher shop, you buy yourself meat, it's chulin. You go to the base hamikdash and you bring a carbon, the piece of meat is kadosh, it's holy. The same animal, it could be the same, uh, each of them is a goat, each of them is a rib steak from the goat. One is kadosh, it's a carbon, and one is chulin, it's Monday. And then in those days, they began to either profane or, create, or make God's name Monday. They desecrated God's name. What does desecration mean? To take something that's holy and to uh, deholyize it. There's no such word. But you take something that's holy and you deholyize it. You remove its hegdish and you make it Monday. In the days of Enosh, the Chil Hashem occurred because they took God's name and they desecrated it by deholyizing Laoleno Hashem and applying holiness to the tree and the sun and the moon. Okay. <clears throat> and that's the concept, the root concept of a Chil Hashem, meaning. I am going to de holy eyes, so to speak, God, and I'm going to give something else the importance of a sovereign, the importance of a creator. I'm going to make something central in my life other than God. This is the root material 
of a Chil Hashem. Now, of course, in the technical halacha, Chil Hashem, you have to have 10, 10 Jews watching what you do. But there's also the concept of Chil Hashem, where you, quote unquote, the holy eyes, God, make him mundane and take the holiness and put it somewhere else. This is possible even for a human being. A human being can make himself into God. He can make himself the center of the universe. He can make his own self-satisfaction the most important thing in his life. When a person exchanges, tra- exchanges uh, serving Hashem with the idea of serving himself, he has performed at the root of the idea Achil Hashem. He's the holy eyes, the Rabboni Sholem, as the sovereign and the center of the world. And he's taken that idea and made himself a selfie. He's made himself the center of the universe. He's made himself the sovereign. And the only important thing is eat, drink, and to be merry because tomorrow we shall die. There's nothing else important except to self to self to self gratify yourself because that's the whole center of your world that becomes a chilul hashem you have the holy eyes god and you've taken that central feature of god in the universe and now you've given it to yourself or you've given it to mankind man is god man is sovereign that's a chilul hashem so when the rabbana shalom says this is a day to lament. This is a day to cry for the Korban Beis Hamikdash and the Korban Yerushalayim. And the Jewish people say, ah, okay, Yerushalayim, beautiful city, Beis Hamikdash, beautiful house, was wonderful. But look, we are the center of the universe. Life is all about eating, drinking, and being merry because tomorrow we're going to die anyway. So let's hop it all in now. That is Achil Hashem. For that, the Rabbana Shalom says, a person cannot get a kapara till the day he dies. And look, look at the irony that the Rabbana Shalom is using here. In verse 13, the Jewish people say, let's rejoice, let's slaughter some animals, let's eat and drink. Ki machanamus, tomorrow we're going to die. That's what they say. Eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow we're going to die. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you, if you're talking about you're going to die tomorrow, that's the kind of talk. Eat, drink, be merry, because we will die tomorrow. This is the Aveira for which you will not get Kapara until you die tomorrow. The irony of HaKadosh Baruch Hu taking the very words of the Jewish people and saying, eat, drink, be merry, because we're the center of the universe and nothing else makes a difference, for tomorrow we shall die. And the Rebbe Shalom says, for that kind of Aveira, you cannot get a Kapara till you die tomorrow. Okay. What is so, we understand this, this is catastrophic for a person to quote unquote, the holy eyes God, and to take features of God, sovereign, creator, the, the Chachma, and to take it and attribute it to himself. We understand the catastrophic nature of such an Aveira. Well, if we go back to the example of the person who ate Chazer in front of two witnesses, he gets his 39 lashes, he uh, does Vidui, and he goes to Yom Kippur, and he's atoned for his sin if he did a sincere chuba. But yet, if in the eating of the Chazer there is a Chil Hashem, he will not get his full atonement until the day he dies. What is it? When we talk about technicalities, what is the root of the Chil Hashem that says you cannot be, a, you, can't, you don't get an atonement till the, until you die? So we learn it out of this, this Pasuk, and we understand the irony. The Jewish people said, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we will die. And God says, okay, for that avail, you get no atonement until tomorrow when you will die. But what exactly is inside, what's groveling inside the Chil Hashem that it can't get a kapora until the person dies? What happens if a person, Lailenu, made a terrible Chil Hashem, and he goes through life, and he does, uh, he does tshuva and tshuva and tshuva and tshuva and tshuva, and he's so sincere about the tshuva. 
at least according to the Gemara, the Gemara says there's no kapara for that sin until the person dies. Now, there are other in Yonim that go into here, the Shari Tshuva talks about it, Rabbi Yonim, the Shari Tshuva, but we're focusing now on the Gemara. What is groveling inside a Chil Hashem that says you cannot get a kapara no matter what you do in your lifetime until you die? And again, as I mentioned, there's Rabbi Yonah that discusses this. We're focusing now on the Gemara and what exactly Chil Hashem is at its, uh, what's inside the Chil Hashem. So for those of you who attended Shia yesterday, and we were talking about, in the Beresh Shia, we were talking about Bechira, and we we're talking about Yehi Rakia Hamaim. On the second day of creation, God separated the waters above from the water below. And by doing that, God created, quote unquote, material that's above. There's now, before the second day of creation, everything was one. On the second day of creation, God separated the universe. There's now something above and something below. And now that there's a concept of above and below, we now have a concept of a neshama that comes from above. We have a concept of a goof that comes from the offer in our dharma, the dust of the earth below. And then we can put them together on the sixth day of creation and have a human being who has a goof and below and a neshama from above. And we now have a human being that's going to have a chila. We talked about yesterday, the, the water below was crying, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what happened to me? A millisecond ago, we were one, the, all the water was one big lob in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and now we got separated. Some of the water is above in, in heaven, near HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and I'm left now, the, the water below, the Mayim Tachtanu say, what happened to me? How did I get on planet Earth? I want to be back up there in the Akadosh Baruch Hu. Akadosh Baruch Hu said, okay, I'm going to let you be poured on the Mizbeach and Sukkis, Nisu Hamayim, and I'm going to also make a rule that anything that's brought on the Mizbeach, Korbonos, Menachos, have to have salt on it, and that's called the Brismelach, and Pashas Vayikra, God said, this is the covenant of salt. Salt shall be put on every Korban, every Mincha that's brought to the Mizbeach, and in this way, God consoled the water below. Yes, you are below, and you have, however, opportunity to be brought on the Mizbeach through salt and through the Nisach HaMayim on Sukkot. So we continued yesterday with a Pachad Yitzchak in Rosh Hashanah. The Pachad Yitzchak explains that that water below is ultimately representative of the man who lives below. And the man who lives below is crying like the water was crying. I want to get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you can get close to me which is the word carbon. Carbon means karev. You can get close to me. But you're going to have to work to get close to me. The Mayim El Yonim, the water that's in heaven, is always close to me. Since creation, there's been water. And on the second day of creation, even before, well, let's leave. From creation, there's been water. And the water, even when it was split on the second day, the water above was just put above. HaKadosh Baruch Hu took the water, split it, and put some water above. What did that water that's above do to deserve being above? Nothing. It did absolutely nothing. God took it and put it above. For our, for in our jargon, when we talk about the Das Tavunos and Bechira, that is a robot. God took the water and put it above. It did nothing to deserve that. That's not the tachlis of creation. That's not the tachlis of the Bria. The tachlis of the Bria, as we learned in the Das Tavunos, is God created man that has freedom of choice, and through the freedom of choice, his Bechira, he makes wise, good Torah decisions for which the Rebona Shalom gives him schah. And that's the ultimate goal of the whole process, that the Rebona Shalom wanted to be mative. He wanted to give good to Bria, and therefore he created a world upon which he can bestow good. And to bestow good, the best good is to deserve the good. 
You deserve it, you earn it, you feel good about it. So Rabban Shalom set up a system where we can earn our reward. And that's through the process of Bechira. If it's just you're doing it because you're a robot, you have no choice, you're just automatically doing what's right, you don't, you're not, the reward you get is free lollipops. You don't feel good about getting free lollipops. Now, some people feel good. I don't have to work. Lazy people, it's great. I sit on my couch and I'm, I'm a uh, couch potato and lollipops are dropping on me all day. There are people that enjoy that, especially today. There are people that love that idea of dole outs and, and everything for free and give me more and give me more. It's not the way the Baruch Hashanah created the world. It's not emotionally healthy. And we see it's not emotionally healthy. We're not in an emotionally healthy world around us. People have, by, by the Rabbi Shalom's teva that he put in people, the need to be to, to, to feel that what they get, they deserve and they earn. So we have the world of Bechira. So the, the water below is the water that's left on earth and has to work its way to get to the Mizbeach. And when it gets to the Mizbeach, it's a carbon. It's now... Uh, we always say sacrifice. Carbon also means the word karev, to come close. The water below has opportunities on sukkis and on carbonus when you use the salt to come close. It does something. We actually pour the water. We actually put the salt on the carbon. But it's we are doing something to bring it close. It's through the doing that's the talkless of the bria not the water above that was taken there by God without it deserving anything. That became the Tachlis of the Bria. And that Tachlis of the Bria we called yesterday Kavod. The, the waters above, this whole idea of God took me without me doing anything and put me above, does not create Kavod for the Rabboni Shalom. Because God took it God took the water, or whatever the water is symbolic of, let's make, you can even call it a malach. God created this thing, and the thing has no bechira. It just does everything right all the time. Parenthetically, we talked about uh, several weeks ago, can a malach go against the word of Hashem? Can a malach be punished? We're going to leave that aside. But basically, a malach is a robot, and a malach doesn't get reward. And that's not the taklas habriyah. So the idea of the things, quote unquote, above that God created to stay above, they didn't do anything to deserve it. And that's not the Takla Sabriya. And therefore, they cannot really honor the Rabbona Shalom. How do you honor the Rabbona Shalom? The Rabbona Shalom schlepped you and took you upstairs in, in front of the Kisya Kavit. What honor is that? You did nothing to honor God. But a human being who has to make choices and by his own volition decides to do a mitzvah, to learn Torah, to do chesed, to be an Oyver Hashem, that decision and that Bechiva is a cover to the Rabbi Nishalayim. Excuse me. And that is, we quoted yesterday, the Abderov. The Abderov explained that in Kedusha we say, Kevoda Mole Olam, Misharsav Shalom Zela Ze Ayema Kom Kevoda. Kevoda Mole Olam, we say in, in one little, almost one breath, Kevoda Mole Olam, God's Kavod, his honor, his prestige fills the entire universe. Misharsav, but God's angels, his servants, Shalom Zela Ze Ayema Kom Kevoda. His servants, the angels are walking around, running around, whatever they do, and they're saying, Ayema Kom Kevoda. Where is God's place of honor and prestige? What are you talking about? The human being just said, I understand Kevodo Moleolam, God's prestige is everything. And the are running around asking each other, where's God's prestige? Where can I honor him? That's the point. And we're not going to go through the marshal we gave yesterday, Dr. Rook said a marshal. We'll leave it for those who are interested. The sheer is, I believe, uploaded. Abderov gave a marshal about two kingdoms. But the point is that the Malachim are asking, I am a kum kavodo. Where is the place that we can give God kavod? Because they don't give God kavod. They're robots. God tells them to do something, they do it. They don't think twice. They don't make a decision. They don't have challenges. God says, go through the wall. They go through the wall. God says, jump into a fire. They jump into a fire. 
I am a kum kavodo. Where is a place that an angel can give God covet? But we say kavoda moliolam. A human being has the opportunity to fill the whole world with God's covered by the things we do, by the things we don't do, by the way we conduct our lives. We can give HaKadosh Baruch Hu cover. <clears throat> and therefore, the Pachad Yitzchak explains, and I believe the Pachad Yitzchak was sent out last week, and it was sent out again yesterday. <clears throat> If you don't have it, I'm going to read just certain sentences from this Pachad Yitzhak going back to the concept of Chil Hashem. <clears throat> and in fact, to understand the Pachad Yitzhak, we're going to have to say quickly the marshal of the Abderov. The Abderov said, you have two kingdoms, kingdom A and kingdom B. Kingdom A, the king makes a rule Tuesday, no one is allowed to wear a pink tie, someone that wears a pink tie off with his head. The people understand why, they don't understand why, it doesn't make a difference in those days. You didn't wear a pink tie on Tuesday unless you wanted to commit suicide, the king was going to execute you. So nobody's wearing a pink tie on Tuesday. And why don't they wear a pink tie on Tuesday? Because really they're scared, they're going to be executed. But not, any, not because they think the king is great, the king is brilliant. The king said, you die if you wear a pink tie. We're not wearing pink ties. Kingdom B, which has its own king, in kingdom B, the people in the kingdom listen and hear that in kingdom A, the king said, you don't wear pink ties on Tuesday. And in kingdom B, the people start thinking about this, pink ties, Tuesday, and they can figure out somehow why there's a logical connection between pink ties and Tuesday. And it makes sense to them. And they say, you know what? We in this kingdom of, of our own volition, we are not wearing pink ties on Tuesday. We understand the ingenuity of the king in kingdom A and of our own volition here in kingdom B, we're not wearing tie, pink ties on Tuesday. I am a comb kivodo. Where is the place where this or king of kingdom A is truly being honored? Not in his own kingdom. They're not wearing pink ties because they don't want to get killed. It's become robotic. Because of the fear of death, they automatically don't wear pink ties on Tuesday. I am a Kavodo. Where was the real place of prestige of the king of kingdom A? In kingdom B, where they say, oh, what an ingenious king. We're going to do this of our own volition here. And they do not wear pink ties on Tuesday. So in, when we talk about covered, there's something in covered that is emphasized by people who are what we call rachok. They're more distant from you than the people who are your loyalists. People who are robotically the loyalists of a king and the king says, don't wear pink ties on Tuesday, and they don't wear pink ties on Tuesday. Okay. They are traditional, eternal loyalists of the king. They're maloch. The covet comes from the place where people don't have to listen to the king, and they decide that they will listen to the king. That's the place of covet. And now Rav Hutna says, the Pachad Yitzchak, Rosh Hashanah, Maimur Yud Beis. And here we have gotten to the point of the fascinating, the pella, the awesome pella of the world of tshuva. Because what are you, when your person is doing tshuva, what's he doing tshuva for? He did Naveira. What's Naveira? He distanced himself from HaKadosh Baruch. A mitzvah brings you closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and Aveira Lo'aleinu creates a distance between the person and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When a person comes to do tshuva, what's he trying to do? He is trying to now reconnect with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I became distant from you, and I want to get close to you. What is happening in the world of tshuva? It's the marshal of the Abderav, and Rafutna gives such a marshal as well. It's the marshal of the Abderov. The person who is perfect is perfect. Gesund to hate. But the person who did Naveira, he, he distanced himself from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He's in kingdom B. 
He's not a subject of the king of kingdom A. He's distanced himself. He's not part of kingdom A. And now the person says, I want to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That is an act of kavod. The Olam HaTshuva, the world of Tshuva, Rav Hutna says, the awesome pinpoint of the world of Tshuva is that the Tshuva brings kavod to the Rabbana Shalom. People look and say, Reuven, he was a Shmechal Shabbos, or Reuven, he was an Eichel Nevelis, and he learned a little, and he, and he did this, he did this, and now he shayim Shabbos, and now he eats kashras, and he shayim etaraz ha That is what? That is covered to the Rabbi Nishalayim. Those who were disloyal to him have now of their own volition decided to reconnect with him. This is the kingdom B saying, we want to wear, the, not, we will not wear pink ties on Tuesday because we too want to be close to king of kingdom A. So what is the world of Tshuva made up of? The underlying awesome principle of the world of Tshuva is that because you did the Aveira, you now, which is not a good thing, but you now have the opportunity to turn around that Aveira and cause it to be a covet for the Rabbi Nishalayla. The tshuva from the Aveira is now going to honor and give God prestige by demonstrating to the world that while you disconnected from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you realize that you want to reconnect HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He's the source of life. That is a covet to the Rabbi Nishalayla. If, however, when a person does an Aveira, built into the Aveira itself is a Chil Hashem, a desecration of God's name, which is the opposite of Kavod. Now, what has happened here? If the whole world of Tshuva, the underlining, the underlining point, what the Kishkis of Tshuva, is that I'm going to take the Aveira that distanced me from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and I'm going to have that Aveira bring me close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so that HaKadosh Baruch Hu can get Kavod, the Olam HaTshuv is based upon bringing Kovet HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But if in the Aveira you did, you desecrated God's name, then in the Aveira itself, you destroyed the world of Tshuva. If the world of Tshuva is built upon the ability to bring Kovet HaKadosh Baruch Hu through Tshuva, but if your Aveira built into it, Chil Hashem, then inside the Aveira, you decimated the most important point of tshuva, which is bringing cover to HaKadosh Baruch. And that's why it is so difficult to do tshuva from the Aveira, from an Aveira that has in it Hashem, because the Aveira inside undermines, decimates, and has destroyed the whole world of tshuva. The whole world of tshuva is based upon I disconnected from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I'm reconnecting to him, and I want to honor and bring prestige to God by showing everybody that I'm reconnecting to the Rabbana Shalom. The Olam HaTshuva is premised on covet to Rabbana Shalom, but if in the Aveira it was a chil HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Shalom, in the Aveira you basically destroyed for yourself and the whole world the premise of tshuva, and that's why the tshuva for, chil, for an Aveira with Chil Hashem is so difficult, and that's why the Gemara says this is the kind of Aveira that has Chil Hashem mixed into it, that has no kapara till the day a person Lailenu dies. So we now understand what Chil Hashem is Lailenu. We understand, and this is the point I wanted to bring out, the world of tshuva, and Rav Hutner calls this here we have arrived at the Pella, the amazing, awesome concept that underlines Tshuva. The underlining concept of Tshuva is that I can take an Aveira. You did the Aveira. You did the Aveira. God told you not to do something. You did it. It's done. What is Tshuva going to do here? What Tshuva does is the person says, I'm going to use the Aveira in such a way that it's going to bring you covered. Because people are going to say, this Mechal Shabbos, he's turned around and he saw the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and he did Tshuva. What a wonderful thing it is that the person got close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu again. 
the person recognized that God is the sovereign, that God created the world, etc. He was a Machal Shabbos, now he's keeping Shabbos. He recognizes that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, so he's keeping Shabbos now. What a covered Shemayim that is. That is the underlying principle of tshuva, the world of kavod to bring kavod to Akadish Farhi. Mir Tashem will continue next week uh, in Yeshaya, next Tuesday, Mir Tashem, Perak Chafbeis, we're up to Pasek Tesvav, which begins, it's in the same Perak, chapter 22, begins a whole, what appears to be a whole new topic about a person called Shevna, uh, who we learned about in Sefer Malachim.